there is hope even for the worst failure. Even for the worst, the most messed up, the most broken, the most torn up to pieces in a person, there is hope. Amen. Because of what happened at the cross. Amen. Amen. Can you welcome the person sitting next to you? I'm so happy to see you. I'm so glad to see you. Give that person a hug, a smile, shake hands. Okay. So, so good to see you all. Okay. Whew. Okay. <clears throat> we are into this series, Finding Jesus in Hosea. Okay, the prophet Hosea, he lived 750 years before Jesus. So that's 2,750 years ago. And the writings of the prophets, they shape the belief, the message of the first century church. You read all over the writings of Paul about our new identity. You can read it all over the book of Ephesians, Colossians, Romans. Where did Paul get these truths? Paul would never preach anything unless it's found in scriptures. This Bible, even the portion we call the Old Testament, that's a thick portion of the Bible. We do not do away with that. That has not become obsolete. No. All over the pages of scriptures, you find Jesus, what he promised to do, and what he has done, and who you are, who I am, who we are, as a result of what he did. That is the purpose of scriptures, to show us Jesus. So we read the Bible. The Bible is not a manual how to be good. No, it is not. It's filled with people who are failures. Jacob was not a good model. He was a liar. He was a cheater. Abraham, he was a liar. The Bible is not a manual that will show you how to be a good person. The, ma the Bible is actually is meant to reveal who God is. His goodness, His promises, what He has done, what He promised to do, and what He has done, and who we are as a result of what He has done. Amen? So tonight, before we turn to the book of Hosea, I want to show you first some scriptures in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 9. In the book of Romans, Paul reveals how we are uh, we, we, have, we have a new name, we have, well, because of the cross, we are a new people. Here in chapter 9, verse 25, Paul quotes Hosea. He said, as he says in Hosea, as the Lord says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people. I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. That is from Hosea chapter 2, verse 23. We are going to take a look at Hosea chapter 2 tonight. But Paul is actually explaining here how we who are Gentiles have become God's people. Okay? Okay, that's verse 25. Can we look at verse 22? What if God, cho choosing to show His wrath and make His power known, bore with great patience the objects of His wrath prepared for destruction. 23. What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy whom he prepared in advance for glory? In, in verse 22, he said, there is a people that are objects of wrath and prepared for destruction. But in the next verse, he says, these people are no longer objects of wrath. They are objects of mercy. And no longer are they prepared for destruction. They are prepared in advance for glory. Yeah. Why? Because He chose to bear us with great patience. Yeah. You see, it says here, He chose to make His riches known. And then verse 24, Even us whom He also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. Here, Paul was justifying his revelation that the, God has called not only the Jews, but also the Gentiles. Actually, you and I, all of us here are Gentiles. None of us here are of Jewish lineage. Amen? Are you a Jew? 
Jutai obo? Uh, Jutai... No, no, we're not, we're not Jews. But, but it was a shocking revelation during the time of Paul. Jews were just scandalized. They were angry. How dare you call those filthy Galatians chosen by God? They are not, they are not heirs of the blessing. They are not part of the promise. Only us, children of Abraham, biological descendants of Abraham. But Paul quoting Hosea. And the verse he quotes here, actually, verse 25, I will read it again. As he says on Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people. I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. What was Hosea talking about? Hosea actually was talking about his children. Because remember Hosea, the Lord called him to marry a really undesirable, you know, can you imagine? Gomer, Gomer, that is a woman's name. Ma Zoe was asking me, what, Gomer is a girl? <laughs> She's a girl. Not only did she have an ugly name, she had this ugly life. She was a prostitute. It was the biggest scandal during Hosea's time. Hosea was, a, was well known all over the kingdom of Israel. Very well respected. A man of honor and dignity. He was a man of God. He was a prophet of God. He was a real prophet. And can you imagine the news? He was going to marry prostitute and it it illustrated how the Lord loves us that no matter how sinful no matter the failure no matter the, the amount of sin and darkness the Lord's love never fails yes. and it, it, you can see that can we turn to Hosea tonight starting with verse 1 Hosea okay Hosea married Gomer, verse 3. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Okay, Gomer had a, uh, a son. They had a son. Verse 4. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel. And I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. You see, Hosea prophesied the destruction of the northern kingdom. The Assyrians invaded the northern kingdom of Israel. And the Assyrians actually, they conquered the tribes of the north, but the southern tribe, Judah, the kingdom of Judah, they were spared. And the northern kingdom of Israel, they were assimilated by the Assyrians. The Assyrians brought in people from different parts of the world, and there was this intermarriage until 700 years later, the northern kingdom, the Israelites became known as the Samaritans. Despised and detested by the Jews. Jews come from the south. They are from the kingdom of Judah. That's why they are called Jews. Because of Judah. Yehudi. From the tribe of Yehuda. So that's who they were. Jews. From one tribe. The southern tribe. But the northern kingdom, they were destroyed by the Assyrians. This was prophesied by Hosea. Call your son Jezreel. Jezreel is the name of a place where Jehu, one of the kings of Israel, massacred King Ahab and Jezebel and all his uh, sons. It was a bloody massacre. And the Lord said, I'm going to punish the northern kingdom because of that massacre I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel verse, three, verse 5 in that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel you can see these names the name of, of, of Hosea's son these are not so nice names they mean judgment okay none of us would ever name our children that no we want names that are nice sounding it has meaning names have meanings and so Look at the second child of Hosea. Gomer conceived again, verse 6, and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her Lorohama. 
The name Lol Rahama, it means not loved. That is actually the verse quoted by Paul. The one name not love, I will call her my love. Because you see in the next chapter, the Lord changed the names of the children of Hosea. That's, that is the revelation. That is where the revelation of your new identity came from. Uh, so here, for I will no longer show, see, the name of the child, the second child, it's a girl. Call her Lo Rohama, for I will no longer show love to the house of Israel, that I should at all forgive them. Verse 7, yet I will show love to the house of Judah, Yehudi, Yehuda, for I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses and horsemen, but by the Lord their God. Here, the Lord gave a very strange promise. The Lord said, I will save the southern kingdom of Judah. But not by bow, nor by arrow, not by sword, not by horses or horsemen. How are you going to do that? How are you going to save us from the Assyrians, from the Egyptians? How are you going to save us? Not by weapons of war, not by military might. From the house of Judah. How are you going to do that? Well, 750 years later, from the lineage, from the tribe of Judah, was born... Jesus, Amen. Yeshua, the Messiah. Amen. And He saved us. Amen. He did not... Can you imagine the... Can you imagine the, the confusion of the people that time? They were waiting for the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Messiah who will save us. This Messiah, He will conquer these Roman invaders. He will save us. We're waiting. And finally, here comes the Messiah. He's not riding a war horse. He's riding a donkey. Very slow. Oh, that's the Messiah. He doesn't have a sword. He's not a fighter. He's not. Is he going to kill? Is he going to fight? And what did he teach? If somebody slaps you, turn the other cheek. What? That's, that's, you know, that's not, that's not how soldiers, that's not how men of war talk. We talk about revenge, we talk about killing. And he said, love your enemies. What? <laughs> the Savior is totally different from their expectation. This, this verse here, the prophet Hosea, he was prophesying, a Savior will come. He will save the house of Judah. Salvation came first from the Jews. From the, from, uh, the house of Judah. And so here, verse 8. Here's the third child of uh, Hosea. After she had win Lo Rohama, Gomer had another son. Okay, second son. Verse 9. Then the Lord said, Call him Lo Ami, for you are not my people. And I am not your God. Lo Ami means not my people. See, these are the names of Hosea's children. Not loved, not my people. Then you go to chapter 2, verse 23. I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called not my loved one. Why did the Lord do this? To give a very clear message. You and me, we were these people. We were the Lorohama. We were the not love people. But now the Lord says, No longer shall you be known as not love. Your new name, you are loved. Amen. That's who you are. And those who are not my people, this is who we were. Prior, prior to the cross, prior to, to Christ, we were not a people. But the Lord says, you who are known as not my people, you are now my people. Wow. Wow. And, and the word, the name Jezreel, the name Jezreel here, actually the Lord gives a new meaning. Instead of punishment and judgment, because the name Jezreel literally means God plants. That's the meaning of the name Jezreel. 
That's why he says here in verse 22, and the earth will respond to the grain and the new wine and the oil, and they will respond to Jezreel. If you have your NIV, you have your footnote, the name Jezreel means God plants. That's why in verse 23, the first sentence says, I will plant her for myself in the land. You are now a planting of the Lord. A new name. Now tell the person sitting next to you, you have a new name. He calls you by a new name. And that is found in Hosea. Okay, that's chapter 2. We've read verse 22 and 23. But can we go to verse 14? Let's backtrack several verses down. Verse 14. Look, look what the Lord says here. Here actually in, verse, in, in, in chapter 2, you can see the anger of the Lord. Look at verse 1 first. Rebuke your mother. Rebuke her. For she is not my wife and I am not her husband. Let her remove the adulterous look from her face and the unfaithfulness from between her breasts. You can see the jealousy of the Lord. You can see here because the people, they were idolatrous. They were worshiping other gods. And, and, and he was jealous. Uncle, I've, I've, been, I've been thinking, what does it mean to be jealous? I, I, I have not, I don't remember being jealous, actually. I, I don't, it's been a long time. When I was high school, so I was so elementary probably, and probably I experienced jealousy. Uh, like, what happens if, uh, for example, uh, okay, what happens if she, Jeff, Jeff really likes a girl, for example. And that girl likes somebody else. Okay, just for example, uh, we don't really know. It's a mystery. What if, what if Jeff really likes this girl, but this girl is in love with somebody else? Can you imagine the pain? Can? No, you cannot. You do not know what I'm talking about. No, you do know. You know? Okay. This, that is the pain of the Lord. Because the Lord so loves His people, but His people. The human heart is a factory of idols. We can make idols of anything. Even ministry, we can make an idol out of our ministry. Ministry can define who we are. It is never meant to define who we are. Ministry is meant to be an expression of the Lord. It is not meant to define who we are, but how prone we are to idolatry. How prone we are. The human heart is a factory of idols. And here you see the Lord's jealousy. In verse 14, he says, I am now going to allure her. You know that, that word allure, what that means? I, I check it up. Can you show it? The definition of allure? The quality of being powerfully and mysteriously attractive or fascinating. <laughs> Whoa. The Lord shows how attractive He is and how fascinating He is. And we lose attraction. We lose our attraction to the world and we are more and more attracted to Him. Amen. And we are more and more fascinated. By who he is and what he does. This is what the Lord is saying. I will allure her. I will lead her into the desert. And, I sp and speak tenderly to her. I love this. Lead, I will lead her into the desert. What is that desert? And he speaks tenderly. That's verse 14. Take a look at verse 8 and 9. She has not acknowledged that I was the one who gave her the grain, the new wine, and the oil. Who lavished on her the silver and the gold. See, this is the Lord's complaint. My people have not acknowledged me. That I was the one who lavished her with silver and gold. I was the one who gave her the grain, the new wine, and the oil. Verse 9, therefore I will take away my grain. When it ripens. And my new wine. When it is ready. I will take back my wool. And my linen. Intended to cover her nakedness. 
So what, what is the Lord saying here? You have not acknowledged me. I was the one who gave you this wine. Now it's my wine. I'll take it back. <laughs> so the Lord brings his people to the desert. And what does he do in the desert? Speak tenderly to her. Wow. Allure her. Woo her. Win her. That's what the Lord does. And thank God for those desert experiences. Amen. Can you tell the person sitting next to you, thank God for the desert experiences. <laughs> Had it not been for those unpleasant experiences, we would not have known how beautiful He is and how wonderful He is. And then, okay, that's verse 14. Look at verse 15. Very, very amazing verse. Verse 15. There I will give her back her vineyards. I will restore your abundance, your vineyards. I will give you these blessings. And then look. And I will make the valley of Accor a door of hope. What is this valley of Accor? It means trouble. It is, there's, there's actually a history there. 700 years before. Valley of Accor, they knew what the Valley of Accor was. Everybody, for hundreds of years, they knew what the Valley of Accor was. It was a constant reminder of judgment by death. Because 700 years before Hosea, when the children, when the people of Israel under the leadership of Joshua, when they went to conquer Canaan. They, they conquered Jericho, right? They won. But the Lord instructed, everything in Jericho is devoted to the Lord. Everything has to be burned. And all the gold and the silver, it is meant to be brought to the treasury of the nation of Israel. But what did Achan do? Achan, he stole this beautiful robe from Babylon. And he stole a bunch of silver and gold. And he did not tell anybody. And when, they, when, when God's people attacked the city of Ai, they were defeated. And the Lord said, the reason why you were defeated is because there's sin in the camp. And through the Umim and Thumim, it was found out it was Achan who actually stole. And what did they do? They killed Achan. Akan and his wife and his children, they stoned him to death. Death by stoning. Can you imagine how cruel, how bloody, how morbid? Death by stoning. Throwing stones at people until they die. And then after they die, they burn them. And after they burn them, they piled huge rocks over them. And for centuries, there was this, this huge pile of rocks. And that place was known as the Valley of Akor. The Valley of Trouble. But here, what was the prophet saying when he said, The Valley of Akor, I will turn into a door of hope. Wow. Because remember, after Joshua dealt with that, after Achan was killed, they were able to win over the enemy. There was victory after the death of Achan. What is the meaning? That is a shadow of the cross. Amen. Because the cross, that's the accor of all accors. The cross, there's this bloody death. There's this cruel, bloody, morbid death. Punishment by death. But then he said, I will turn that accord into a doorway of hope. Amen. Why is that now a doorway of hope? Because now you are free. No longer are you under penalty. No longer will you be judged because all judgment was upon him. Punishment and judgment by death. Yeah. Whew. You are now free. Amen. The accord of Calvary. That is the doorway of hope. Amen. There is hope even for the worst failure. Even for the worst, the most messed up, the most broken, the most torn up to pieces in a person. There is hope. Amen. Because of what happened at the cross. Amen. 
It has become a doorway of hope, a gateway of hope. That is where the Lord will restore the vineyards. And then, uh, next sentence, the prophet said, There she will sing as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up out of Egypt. You will sing as in the days of your youth. I, I remember how little children, they just sing. They just love to sing. Whatever they're doing. As we grow older, after all the failures and after all the problems, we stop singing. <laughs> and some of us, we realize we don't really have the gift, so we stop singing. <laughs> but what is, what is the Word of God saying here? She, the Lord will renew your innocence. The Lord will renew. He, he gives you life. And once again, you sing. Amen. You don't sing to please the Lord. You simply sing because you know He is so happy with who you are. As when the day you came up out of Egypt. That is talking about our, del our deliverance from sin or from slavery. Then verse 16. Look at verse 16. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. Hey, this is a change of status. We have seen before how there's a change of names. Now it's a change of status. You will no longer call me my master. But you will call me darling. <laughs> my husband. <laughs> there's a big difference. There's a big difference between a master and slave relationship and a husband and wife relationship. This husband and wife relationship, that is, humanly speaking, that is the highest, the deepest, and the most valuable relationship. You listen, you turn on your radio, uh, you, you tune in some FM stations, every song, these singers, they never sing about their cats or dogs. They never sing about their business. All those songs are songs of love. All those songs, these are love songs. You know, I'm thinking, all the songs I've ever heard, FM. Sample? I met a girl. Oh my Lord. <laughs> All of this. And it is a revelation of the Lord's heart. We are made this way because we are made in His image and in His likeness. We are designed. He is the lover actually. He is the lover and we are the beloved. Amen. And he says, no, don't call me my master. I remember how it was when, when I would admire pastors who would pray, Master, I am your servant. <laughs> the Lord says, no, no, stop it. Don't call me master. Call me my love. Call me my lover. Because that's who I am, and you are my beloved. Amen. There's a new status. Amen. Verse 19, look at verse 19. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. Verse 20, I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. I will betroth you. I'm going to marry you. Pwede itong kanta ko ng, will you marry me or marry me? <laughs> that's, that's, this is the Lord. Can you see the Lord's heart here? And you can see the jealousy of His heart. That's why He said, look at, uh, can, can we go back to verse 10? Verse 10. This, is, this sounds like really hard, but look at verse 10. So now I will, I will expose her lewdness before the eyes of her lovers. No one will take her out of my hands. You can see here the Lord saying, No one will take her out of my hands. Talking about idolatrous Israel. I'm jealous for her. And this is what I'm going to do so that no one will take her out of my hands. Wow. 
Now, okay, we close with Hosea chapter 6. Uh, Jenny read this earlier. But here in verse 3, let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge Him. And as surely as the sun rises, He will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. Let us acknowledge Him. This is the challenge. Acknowledge the Lord. Press on to acknowledge Him. See, the verse before that, this is the amazing prophecy about the resurrection of Jesus. He said in verse 2, after two days, He will revive. The word revive, it means to bring life to the dead. After two days. Day one is Friday. Day two is Saturday. After two days, that is Sunday, He gives life to the dead. And then, on the third day, he will restore us. On the third day, the resurrection of Jesus, He has restored us to this beautiful relationship with Father. He has raised us up. He resurrected us so that we may live in His presence. All of these beautiful things that, that the Lord did. How can we experience this? Okay, verse 3. Let us acknowledge Him. What does it mean to acknowledge? What happens when you acknowledge the Lord? Look at verse 3. Let's continue reading. As surely as the sun rises, He will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. This is a signal of a new season. Winter is over. The rain has come. The sun rises. Winter is over. The spring rains have come. A new season. So we have seen how we have a new name and how we have a new status. Here we see there is a new season. Winter is over. During winter, nothing grows. There's no color. Everything, everywhere you look, it's the same color. But after winter, okay, we have no winter here. Now by winter, there is springtime has come. Green, yellow, blue all color life see there is a new season how how do we experience this by acknowledging him Amen. what does it mean to acknowledge him what does it mean like for example if 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 you tell me pastor ching uh, i really like your teaching i really like how you share the insights that you share i really admire i thank you so much and i will tell you well actually it's because of my wife it's because of my long conversations with her every morning. That's where these insights come from. What am I doing when I say that? I am acknowledging her. I am acknowledging her. It's just not just me. I have somebody with me. That's what it means. To acknowledge the Lord means, oh, I'm like this because He is so good. I'm like this because of what He did. I am accepted by Father. I have access before the throne of grace because of what He did. Amen. Not because I'm good. Not because I'm a high performer. Not because I'm such a nice guy. No. Actually, contrary. Totally contrary to that. It's all because of Him. That's what it means to acknowledge Him. And when we acknowledge Him, we begin to experience the new season of God. Okay, can we close with this verse? A song of songs related to verse 3 of Hosea chapter 6. Song of songs chapter 2. Okay, here are love songs, very ancient love songs by the king Solomon. Verse 10, chapter 2, verse 10. My lover spoke and said to me, the lover here is, is the Lord, and we are the bride. My lover spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. Verse 11, See, the winter is past, the rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth, the season of singing has come, the cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig trees form its early fruit, the blossoming vines spread their fragrance. 
Arise, come my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. This is the Lord's invitation. There is a new season because of what happened at the cross. How do we enter that? We enter by acknowledging Him, by pressing on to know Him.